Um, is somebody going to read the questions to us, right? Yes. We're not going to have to look at it. Okay, so I started the webinar, so we'll see if people start joining us. Okay, they're starting to join. I'll let you know when we get a good number because all I can see are <laughs> numbers. I can't see faces. Mm -hmm. Everyone's starting to join us. Yay. I have about 30 that registered, so I'll wait till we get up close to 30. And I will put a welcome message in the chat. Are you also going to put the books available for purchase in the chat? Um, yeah, I'll have to grab those links. Still have five people that have joined. We'll wait for a couple more to join. And then we'll get started. So Carrie, you're gonna do the initial introduction and then I'm gonna do the bios, is that correct? Yes. And you'll also do the questions. Right, right. And I see it's already recording. Good. Okay, I must have pre I must have set it up in advance. And I will check and see if our captionist, yep, our captionist is waiting. Okay, we have eight. See if I can get us up to at least halfway, half of our attendees, and then we'll begin. I think it's okay if we wait a few minutes because a lot of times I have challenges just logging on, you know, the last minute. Mm -hmm. I think that I'm ready to go and then scrambling. So you can all just smile. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everybody, come on in. We got eight people. Should we just go back to chit chatting until more people come instead of sure. you dead can. space, dead you air? Can. You're welcome to, they, they, <laughs> just as long as you know, they can hear you <laughs> up to nine. Important. I'll just interrupt when we're ready to start. I'll give it another minute or so for people to log on, but you guys are welcome to chat and I'll just say, okay, we're going to begin when it's time. Good. Oh, yes. <laughs> so I just finished your book, Wendy and Madeline, Aww. this week. I really loved it. Thank you. I'm, I'm curious <laughs> about what made you, what gave you the idea of the hula hooping? Oh, there's a whole story behind that. We'll, I, we'll I saw a that. video of Madeline. <laughs> reading while hula hooping you got pretty good at it wow <laughs> <laughs> madeline you're you're muted oh my gosh are you both uh where do you all both live madeline madeline and wendy we're on um you know the other side of the state line from laura in virginia and um i'm in arlington oh, and, yeah, and i'm in falls church yeah wendy's like... next next door like oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Sadia gets the prize for being farthest away. Yeah. That's right. I'm you were supposed to be visiting. <laughs> oh. I'm the farthest away from everyone all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Are you in Houston? Yes, I live that's in Houston. Okay. That's so what I thought I remembered. Kind of very different from, you know, <laughs> the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it looks like we do have some people joining us and saying hello. Yay. I'm going to wait yeah. till at 105, I'm going to start. We have, now have good. 11 people signed in. 
There may be more. It looks like oh, we have yay, families Aaron's joining here. us. Oh my goodness. There's some families old. joining us. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I mean, Texas is nice. Uh, you know, you, I feel like there are a lot of advantages to living in a place with a very low cost of living. You can have a big house, you can have a big car, stuff like that. But you know, it gets, it's, it gets very hot. Oh, Zoya is here. Sadia, Zoya is here. Hooray! Hi. <laughs> Zoya started a book club and we chatted with her book club group um, last weekend. It was really nice. Oh, hello. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and begin. We got 11 participants and their families joining us so far. Welcome everyone to Hi. Howard County Library Systems Meet the Authors, uh, Faruqi Chauvin. Rosenberg and Shang. <laughs> Sadia Faruqi and Lara Chauvin are authors of A Place at the Table and Madeline Rosenberg and Wendy Shang are authors of Not Your All-American Girl who will read from their books and discuss their characters and the challenges that they face as well as what it's like to collaborate on novels. Um, I will put in the chat shortly a link for books available for purchase and signing. You would get a signing plate if you purchase a book of theirs through from books with the past. I'll put that in the chat. Um, I'm also going to put in the chat now a link if you need captioning from Maryland Relay and you just take the link for Maryland Relay and open it in a browser next to your Zoom screen so that you can see the captions. Um, I just added the Maryland Relay link and I will see and they have started adding in the captioning. Now I will go uh, search out the link for books with the past purchases and put that in the chat. What I'm going to ask is if you have questions as we go, um, there's a Q&A feature on your Zoom. If you have questions for the author specifically, if you will add them into the Q&A and we will go through those when we get to the point where we are actually asking the author specific questions. I'm going to turn it over to um, Deborah Basilovich, who will get the authors started on their introductions. And once again, I will put in the chat the link to be able to purchase the titles from Books of the Past, or you are welcome, of course, to borrow books from our library in person through e-audio or digital downloads. And the in-person version is selecting your book titles and doing contactless pickup at this time. So I'll put those links in the chat for you. Okay, Deborah, you can take it away. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, Sadia Faruqi is a Pakistani-American author, essayist, and interfaith activist. Her book, Meet Yasmin, was the first book in an early reader series about a Pakistani-American girl. It received starred reviews, and she's also author of the adult fiction book, Brick Walls, Tales of Hope and Courage from Pakistan. She lives with her husband and children in Houston, Texas, where she is editor-in-chief of Blue Minaret, a magazine for Muslim art, poetry, and prose. Laura Chauvin's debut middle grade novel, The Last Fifth Grade of Emerson Elementary, won several awards, including NCTE 2017 Notable Verse, her novel, Takedown, was selected by Junior Library Guild and PJ Our Way and was on the ALA's Amelia Bloomer list of feminist books. Her most recent book is A Place at the Table, co-written with author activist Sadia Faruqi. Laura is a longtime poet in the schools in Maryland. She likes to knit, bake, and doodle robots. Let's listen <laughs> Sadia and Laura as they read from their book. Hi, Sadia. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, I guess I'll go first. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, we're, uh, we're doing our reading in order. So uh, this is from A Place at the Table, which um, is dual voice. So my, uh, my character is Sarah, and we'll start there. Mama wraps a hand on the metal island to get everyone's attention. The clang from her wedding ring makes a few of them jump. Thank you, Sarah, Mama says. Everyone, this is my daughter, Sarah. She will be spending her club time doing her homework. 
quietly. <laughs> I nod and try to cover my sketchbook with my arms. Great. Now everyone knows my mother dragged me along and that I was doing everything but homework. Mama throws me a sorry look and continues. Let's measure two cups of rice in this bowl. As the kids gather around my mother, I start up my music again. Before I can look down at my drawing, I notice Elizabeth watching me. Not in a mean way, more like she's curious. I hate people staring at me as if I've got a horn growing out of my forehead. I have to resist the urge to cross my eyes or make a face at her. It's not like we've ever officially met, even though we share Miss St. Emma's language arts class. Sometimes I see her in the halls, but Poplar Springs is so different from Ikra Academy, like a big noisy circus where all the performers know each other except me. I don't talk to anyone most days. I keep my head down and rush from one class to another. I suddenly miss Rabia like a craving for that mint chutney mama I used to make when I was little. I haven't seen her since school started. I notice that the edge of my tunic sleeve, sleeve is wrinkled and I smooth it carefully. My eyes shift down at my drawing. The garden seems ugly now. Whose idea was it to draw a single rose in the center of all these white lilies? Oh yeah, mine. I feel someone's gaze on me. I sneak a peek, looking up at the kids gathered around the cooking island. Elizabeth again. She raises her right hand to her glasses and I notice she's wearing bracelets, her only jewelry. One has a Star of David charm. It glints in the fluorescent kitchen lights like it wants to be noticed. When she sees me looking back at her, she smiles a little. Oh, the last thing I want to be is friendly right now, stuck in this hot kitchen with a bunch of rude kids making mama nervous. I glare at Elizabeth until her smile slips and she looks away. Good. Message sent and received. Hi, everybody. I'm Laura Chauvin, and I'm going to pick up with Elizabeth's chapter, which um, takes place in the same scene in the after school cooking club where our two characters meet. Sara snaps her book closed, but not before I see a swirling garden created in black ink, one red flower in the center. It's beautiful. If I could draw like that, I'd study animation when I grow up, but my hands are big and clumsy. I'm better at kneading dough than drawing. Sara slides her sketchbook into her backpack without saying another word. Conversation over, I think. I head to the table where Maddie is already sitting next to Stephanie. Stephanie's all right, I guess. People like her because she's always sharing samples of the cupcakes she bakes, but she'd rather watch America's Got Talent than Doctor Who. Maddie and I used to argue for hours about which actor was the best Doctor Who, a time-traveling do-gooder who clashes with monsters, saves Earth from aliens, and witnesses historical events like the destruction of Pompeii. How cool is that? Not cool enough for Maddie, now that she's friends with Stephanie Tolson. Maddie's complaints about Mrs. Hamid's accent and the spicy food are annoying, but I put up with her because she's my best friend. When it's finally time to eat, everyone gets a ladle full of bright yellow rice and potatoes in a plastic bowl. I chew slowly, savoring the flavors. They're so delicious that the noise in the room fades away for a second. How can such simple ingredients make my tongue feel like it's dancing with warmth and smoke? I take another bite and shoot Maddie a huge grin. And that's when she spits her rice into a napkin. My tongue is on fire, she tells everyone at the table. Sara drops her plastic fork with a clatter. All eyes turn to the end of the table where she's sitting by herself. She treats everyone to a lethal scowl. This is why she has no friends. So that's how, that's the very rocky start to uh, Sarah and Elizabeth's friendship. Um, so Sadia, actually, I was thinking since you reminded me it's World Mental Health Day today, one of the things that we talk about in our book is how, um, how immigration and being first-generation American 
sort of what's the overlap with, with um, what these girls are experiencing and mental health? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, that's, that's an important part of the story, how uh, Im immigrants and immigrant families often feel lonely and they don't have access to, you know, just services. It might not be big mental health issues, but being not having friends, uh, not having anyone to talk to, to, to be lonely. Those are things that can have a really uh, profound effect on you. Yeah, and, and it's definitely or something that's even worse. Right. It's something that my mom, who's an immigrant from England, experienced for sure. I think she not only did she not have the resources of, you know, the small town where she grew up and her family, but she also didn't know how to access resources when she moved here. So, you know, that was a big part of it. But I also feel like since we're talking about collaboration today, in our writing during our writing process it was really helpful for me to talk about that i don't think i'd ever spoken with somebody else kind of so frankly as you and i did about how immigration you know the the pluses and the minuses and how it impacted our different families and that definitely shows up in our in our story it does and you know as an immigrant myself i never really thought about those issues like when you're going through something it doesn't it doesn't really, um, it, you don't realize it. And, uh, you know, I came to the US in my early 20s. I was a newly married bride. Um, I, everything was new. I had to, and I couldn't, I was already, I had finished my bachelor's, but it wasn't accepted. So I had to go back to school and I literally had to do three years of college again with courses that I already um, had studied and um, then struggling to get a job and a visa and things like that. And then having kids and not knowing how to deal with that, um, not having family around to kind of fall back on and have that support. But in all that, I never thought, okay, maybe I need some help. Maybe this is not normal. Maybe this is something that I'm, I'm struggling with because of my unique circumstances. So um, I think that for me especially, and, and probably for you too, uh, that was an important part that we wanted to put in our book so that families can get kind of like just some clarity around, um, around the issues that they might be facing, but they're not aware of it. Yeah, I think one of the things that you and I have talked about before, and we've talked a little bit, is I feel like my my mom didn't have a friend when I was growing up. She didn't have a close friend, and it's like um, one of the things that I wanted to do in this story was give her a friend. So I love the relationship between the two moms in this story because it's kind of like giving giving my mom that thing that she needed, even though I can't go back in time and give it to her in real life. At least in in a story, I can kind of fix that little piece of um of our lives growing up which is a really nice thing that we can do as as writers yeah that's true that's true pretty <laughs> much i mean i feel like i got into writing because i could rewrite my own like childhood and and put in things that i didn't have or things that i wish had turned out in a certain way so that's definitely the perk of, of um of writing um and and you know we, I agree with you that that having those secondary characters that are adults, a lot of middle grade doesn't have that, and so it was important for me because I I often would read books and think, well, where are the parents? I'm like in, you know, organizing things for my kids and being there with my kids all the time. I don't understand these kids who are going off and solving mysteries by themselves. <laughs> Yeah, right. And it was actually, it's one of the things that I really loved about um, Wendy and Madeline's book, um, especially the grandmothers are so present in the in the main character's life that um, I felt like that was a nice overlap with our book that, you know, the kids are solving their own problems and actually they're solving some problems or helping to solve some problems in their families. But they're, you know, they're in that middle school age and their role in the family is getting to be different at this point in their lives. And they're, Sarah in particular is very actively asking for a bigger role in um, and how the family operates. And I really like that part of the story. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I think thought the first generation kids tend up end up doing that a lot. Yeah. Um, it didn't happen with my family because we were, uh, you know, we didn't have those specific struggles, especially people who come to the to another country where they don't speak the language. 
that is uh, often their kids who are doing their translating and doing things for them and helping. You know, my kids are more like, mom, you don't know anything because you didn't grow. You weren't born in America, so I have to hear that. But at least, you know, I can figure it out. <laughs> yeah, some of the people that I interviewed who are first generation or who came here as children, um, definitely talked about that experience of doing things like filling out tax forms because their parents needed help. And, uh, you know, it was, they had a, a translate, yes, a pint-sized translator, but they have a translator in the house and they're going to take advantage of that. Um, so yeah. I think that that sort of growing up quickly can often be something that first generation um, kids share or, or kids of an immigrant families can share. Um, uh, you know, we're going to talk about this some more. Obviously, um, there are characters in, in Wendy and uh, Madeline's book who are also having some of these experiences with immigration and, and uh, bringing culture over to the United States and assimilation. Um, I was going somewhere with this and now I can't remember where, where I was going. So maybe now is a good time to pass it along to, uh, <laughs> to our other co-author friends. Okay. Tech team. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. And yes, we have a few more questions for you a little bit later. Um, so right now, uh, first I would like to introduce Wendy Wang Long Shang. She's the author of uh, The Great Wall of Lucy Wu, which was awarded the Asian Pacific American Award for Children's Literature. The Way Home Looks Now, an Amelia Bloomer project list selection and a CCBC choices list selection. And this is just a test, which she co-wrote with Madeline Rosenberg, and which is a Sydney Taylor honor book awarded for outstanding Jewish literature for children. She lives with her family in the suburbs of Washington, DC. Uh, Madeline Rosenberg is the author of books for kids of all ages, including Cyclops of Central Park, The Smutsy Family, Nanny X, How to Behave at a Tea Party, and Dream Boy. This is just a test, which she co-authored with her friend Wendy Wan Long Shang, was a finalist for the New York Children's History Book Prize and was selected as a Junior Library Guild book. Not Your All-American Girl, a sibling book, to this is just a test, was also selected by the Junior Library Guild. Please visit Madeline online at www.madelinerosenberg.com. Go ahead and please. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start with the reading because I'm going to just start reading from the very beginning of our book. Um, and then I will let Wendy pick up a little later. Um, so this book, we refer to it as a sibling book because this is just a test, is about Lauren's older brother. And in this test, we focus on the slightly younger sister. <laughs> okay. My fifth grade teacher once said that Tara and I were the royal we. We didn't like today's lunch. I told her after we had been served sandwiches with meat that had weird jellied circles. It was like someone had tried to turn bologna into a stained glass window. May we please use the bathroom? When do we get to take Lola home for the weekend? Lola was the class guinea pig. It's always the royal we with you two, isn't it? Said Mrs. Mortson. I hadn't heard the term royal we before, but it made sense because I always felt a bit grander when Tara was around. Being with Tara was like being in a patch of sunshine. She was the one teachers loved and the one who always got picked early for teams in PE. She was the one who got the blue ribbon at the science fair. She was the one someone was always saving a seat for in the cafeteria, but she sat with me. And I was the one she gave the other half of the best friend's necklace to. I have contributed to our mutual, I have contributed to our mutual royalty exactly once when we tried out for the school Christmas concert as a duet in fourth grade. I felt a little weird trying out for a Christmas concert as someone who does not celebrate Christmas. We sang Winter Wonderland, which does not specifically mention Christmas so that no one in my family got upset. Tara said we got it because of me. 
But in everything else, the spotlight was on Tara. I thought of it this way. In your typical Pac-Man lunchbox, Tara was the PB&J and I was the apple. You needed both to have a complete meal, even if one was the star. Tara was the star of our friendship. I found out later that the royal we was something that kings and queens used instead of I. Queen Victoria supposedly said, we are not amused, after someone told a scandalous story in her presence. Tara and I still say this whenever my brother tells a so-called joke or when my father asks me to take out the garbage. I can do the British accent with just the right amount of snobbiness. Most of the time, everything's better with the royal we. But being the royal we hasn't always worked out. For instance, the royal we had to stay inside during recess three times in Mrs. Mortson's class for talking too much. In October, the royal we did not win the WKRZ concert tickets to see the police. And only half of the royal we got designer jeans because the other half has unreasonable parents who do not see the value of having someone else's name embroidered on your hiney. So I'm going to stop there and let Wendy pick up with the section a little bit later. There we go. Uh, so you could see that uh, Lauren and Tara are very good friends, but they're, they've moved in to middle school and they don't have any classes together. And so they develop a, a plan to hang out by both auditioning for um, the school musical. And when we, uh, when the next part I'm going to read is when Lauren's coming home to talk to her grandmothers and she's very excited by how her audition went. So uh, just, just as a little background, Waipua is her Chinese grandmother uh, who lives with them. And Safta is her Jewish grandmother who lives around the corner. Also, this takes place in the 1980s. So uh, there's a mention of a VCR, which stands for video cassette recorder, which is how we used to record shows back in the day. <laughs> Waipua stabbed at every button on the VCR. David said he recorded it for me, she said. Making a recording on the VCR was always dicey because you weren't sure you'd done it right until after the show you wanted was over. The TV screen remained stubbornly dark. Did you remember to change the input? Softa prided herself on keeping up with technology. Of course, I changed all the inputs. Did you change the ch TV channel to three? It's on three. I could just tell you who won, Softa said. I don't want to know. I want to watch, said Waipo. Watching Star Search is a ritual in my house on Sunday nights. Only this week, Waipo missed it for Mahjong. David, I suspected, watched for the spokesmodels, but he paid attention to the other categories too. We usually agreed with each other on who should win, but we didn't always agree with the judges. Safta and I had a ritual at the end of the show. Those teen singers were good, she would say when Ed McMahon brought out the winners and shook their hands while everyone was dancing, but they're no Lauren Horowitz. And then I would say, Safta, and roll my eyes like it was the silliest thing she could say. But here's what nobody knew, not even Tara. I spent large amounts of time wondering if I could sing on Star Search. If I got a part in the play, maybe it would be a sign. I like that Sam Harris, said Waipo, pushing the VCR button one last time. I hope he moves on to next week. Well, said Safta, it's your lucky day. I told you not to tell me, Waipo said. All I said was that it's your lucky day. Why put change the inputs again? So now we don't need to watch. In a way, she seemed relieved. How was school, said Safta. Since my mom, who was a paralegal, was away working on a trial for most of the week, my grandmothers were trying to fill in for her. The big things they did were making sure we ate something besides breakfast cereal and asking about school. I couldn't hold it in anymore. My audition went great. I'm definitely going to get a good part, I think. <gasps> kind of horror said Safta, spit. She believed that saying something good, will something good will happen brings bad luck. Spitting is supposed to cancel it out, although there is no scientific proof to, evidence to support this. I pretended to spit. Poo, poo, poo. Of course you will get a good part. You have a beautiful voice, said Waipo, but she didn't sound happy about it. What are you doing, said Safta. Now you spit. Fine. Waipo leaned over and spit for real in a wastebasket. This is silly, says the woman who told me not to sweep the floor last month. You want to sweep away your fortune? Next Chinese New Year, you sweep, but at your own house. We always knew you were going to be a star, Safta said to me. The bar mitzvah confirmed it. For some reason, Safta didn't like she had to spit when she said, didn't feel like she had to spit when she said this. A doctor is the star of the OR, Waipo said. An accountant is the star of tax season. A lawyer is the star of the courtroom. So she'll be a Broadway star who finds a cure for cancer, said Safta. She can be anything she wants. 
this was something my mother always said to me. Awesome. So um, just to talk a little bit about this book and to yeah. um, kind of start in the middle, one of the things with, with this project is that it was actually the second book in this world. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, how we always say to people, to kids, um, you know, everybody has their own story. Mm -hmm. I feel like this sort of accentuated, like even in the same family, people yes. will have a story, but the story is different. It's going to be different for every member of the family. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Wendy, like, how did you feel going back into this world and just dropping into the same world again? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, it, I thought it was so great to go back into this world and you know, when you have, you know, you work so hard to develop these characters and give them each a unique point of view and an outlook. And it's a, it's a little bit of a cheat code, I guess, when you, you know, when you get to drop back in and you don't have to kind of rethink all your characters or think about how it's going to structure. And what's funny, you know, that we didn't plan necessarily to go back into this world. And so then we had to go back and look at all the little breadcrumbs that we had left about Lauren in the first book to figure it out. But what about you? What was it, what was it like for you to like, go back in. I mean, I felt very comfortable mm -hmm. <laughs> jumping, jumping back into that world. But, you know, in, in the beginning, I was a little bit worried that, oh, it's going to be, you know, more of the same or too much of the mm -hmm. same. And it ended up being because Lauren and her brother are very different people. Mm -hmm it ended up being a very different book, but I felt like some of the themes came back around, um, you know, the theme for just speaking up and saying what you need to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I was thinking about one of the things, you know, one of, <laughs> you know, in this, in this time where we're all talking about, you know, we're, we're having a national conversation about race, we're having a national conversation about, you know, all these, all these terms that we didn't have in the 80s. Right. And, you know, the, the, this, this trope that comes up like, you know, like, I have a insert name of person, I have a blank friend, so I can't be whatever, what, I can't be racist, I can't do this, you know, I, could, I wouldn't have done that. And this book kind of flips it a little bit because what happens in the story, I don't think I'm giving too much away, is that this, this uh, musical that Lauren did so well and everyone told her she's done so wonderfully is that she gets a very small role and Tara once again is the star and the music teacher tells her very, you know, very forthrightly that she feels that the, the star of the show should have been, you know, should be an all-American all -American looking girl and she didn't feel that Lauren looked the part. And, and then Tara kind of, um, doesn't really help, you know, like she's not, she kind of goes along with it. And so there's, we kind of flipped it because I think there's something Lauren struggles with where she, she's like, how can my friend be doing this to me and trying to figure out how to, how to work that out. Right. Yeah. Which is, you know, something that um, comes up in, in place at the table as well as, as a, as a really big theme, which we can talk about. More in a bit. I remember like when we were first having conversations and writing the book with, um, set in the 80s i had even used the term asian at one point and you were like mm, no we didn't even <laughs> use the term asian in the 80s <laughs> it was like everybody was talking you know and you know very yeah. specifics but you didn't have yeah no the, oriental was still yeah oriental yeah. was still used quite a bit yeah. yeah yeah um and then laura had asked when we were you know in the chat earlier um how hula hoops ended up in our book and so that seems like something that we should <laughs> talk about too because they're okay. not right it even ended up on the cover yes um, which i love yeah. <laughs> oh right you want to tell the story should i tell the story i think you should i think i should oh so we knew that there was going to be a musical and we kind of you know we were trying to go with a, a known musical you know there's wizard of oz there's uh i don't know you know you, any, any number of musicals that we felt like kids would know. But the thing is, is that when you quote things in books, you know, you have to have permission or you have to be able to pay a certain amount of money for the right to, to quote things. So we weren't going to use Hamilton, say, or anything like that, or within Hamilton, it exists back then. But um, 
we were kind of dancing around this whole thing because we, we didn't really want to walk into that territory of, of using something too much. And it was kind of a struggle because, you know, part of the fun of musicals is are the lyrics and talking about it in a very direct way. And so we were sitting in a coffee shop kind of trying to work this out. And then we came up with this idea, which right. was we would write our own musical. Right. About hula hoops. About hula hoops. I don't, I don't, hula hoops, I don't know how we came up with I hula hoops. I think you just sort of like were grabbing for <laughs> whatever. Oh, actually, I do know because we have been talking a little bit about dancing and footloose. Okay. And then, then we were like, wait. Hula hoops. <laughs> hula hoops. Why not hula hoops? And so, um, we also found out during this something that I didn't know, which was that Wendy was not much of a hula hooper. That's um, putting it generously. <laughs> <laughs> but so we actually signed up um, later <laughs> for, for a hula hoop class with this woman who lives in Australia. Oh, yeah. So it was like six o'clock in the morning for her, six o'clock at night. For, Donna, yeah. for us and then we were you know on through zoom because we were all separated just to see if we could you know up our game a little bit yeah and she was really good like like she knows how to teach people like me how to you know she's like oh you know you need to do this and i can you know like she was watching us through zoom and she's like oh i can see what you're doing you're trying to you know you need to go back and forth and not try to make a circle and yeah she was she was kind of amazing but I mean, that moment in the coffee shop when we decided on a hula hooping musical, and I remember we were just sitting there and we just started Googling hula hoop. And then we discovered that like, yeah, that like, you know, there are people who said like, yo, this is, you know, that's a, it's a very, um, what's the word, kind of immoral kind of toy because you're swinging your hips. And then, you know, the Russians, you know, during the Cold War saying like, this is just a sign of American, you know, lack of American culture. It was just, it was just like kind of all built on itself. And it just, it was like, it's like we kind of worked for this point and then we were rewarded by the creativity gods by having a musical that I felt like worked so wonderfully with the story. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, the other thing, and we can talk about this in just a second when we um, open up to mm -hmm. some of Deborah's questions is, um, you know, when we were talking about what was going to come up in this story mm -hmm. with Vincent Chin and with, um, well, it wasn't, I guess it, it, it wasn't at the time called, you know, prejudice against Asians because it was more specific than that. But mm -hmm. we keep thinking that these are things of the past, right? We keep thinking we're done with it. You know, yep. anti-Semitism, oh, you know, that's so 1970s or whatever, but no. No. We're not even, like, at least if not done, at least, like, they're, the moral, you know, like, you know, the side of, you know, what is right is very clearly drawn. And now, you know, in this age of coronavirus, you know, anti-Asian anti hate speech is way up, you know, and this is, this is you know, all part of it, so... Yeah. Until we, I think until we make a very direct and intentional move to learn from these things, you know, we'll, we'll always think we make progress, but then we'll always backslide. Thank you. Deborah's gonna, thank you, Wendy and Madeline. Deborah's gonna start us off with some questions for the panel and for uh, everyone else who's attending, uh, feel free to put questions in the Q&A. Um, that Deborah and I will look at as well as the panel is answering a couple of questions from Deborah. Wonderful. Uh, so I would like to start, and this is a question for each of you. Um, if you could um, reflect on what are the advantages of writing with a partner? And conversely, if there are disadvantages. Okay, and um, how I, do you... How do you want to start? Like, who do you want? Oh, let's go in the same order that we did before. I think okay. that, that makes sense. So Saudi, Saudi is going to go first then. Advantages of working um, with a co-author. I mean, for me, the biggest one is that it's no longer a lonely writing experience that nobody understands why you're, you know, struggling to do this thing. <clears throat> Most of us, I, I know for, certainly for me, I have, uh, you know, I'm... I don't have anyone to talk to about my projects or to brainstorm or to go through mm. things when I'm writing a book by myself. So just having that 
that person who is involved as much in the project as you, you can talk to and go things all, go over stuff. That's invaluable. Yeah, I agree. And um, for me, I tend to be a, a pantser. So <laughs> my first drafts are usually all over the place. I'm just a bit very exploratory. And for this project, because Sadia and I were alternating chapters, we had to come up with an outline. And also, I, it kept me very accountable. So, you know, Sadia would give me a chapter, I'd read through it and make some comments. And then I had a very set amount of time to get the next chapter done. So it, that was really good for me because I tend to be a lot more loosey goosey in my writing when, um, when I'm working by myself. So I feel like we really learned a lot from each other because our processes are very different. And I, we both picked up some new writing skills from that. Yeah, definitely. Um, for me, I think one of the benefits is that when you go to sleep at night, when you wake up in the morning, your story is longer. <laughs> I think that is very key. Yeah. And um, I think another thing is, you know, just in talking about the book, um, especially like during these times when you have a new book that's come out, you know, you want to scream and say, hey, everybody, I have a new book. But it's really hard to do that because there are so many other things going on there's like a crisis every time you look at the news but when you have a partner you know I would I have a much easier time talking about Wendy than I do about myself <laughs> so, so I think that helps a little bit too Wendy uh, what about you um well so Madeline and I met in a, a critique group and so you know by the time we had agreed to to work together or I you know, trick Madeline into working with me. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, like I had such a level of trust in Madeline, like, and I think that's just like such a critical foundation to any writing partnership that you have to, you have to trust that person. And so like, we were used to being like, you know, being each other's go-to reader on that level. And I think just being able to, like, I think what Sadia was saying, like, you know, you take it to that next level where you know that somebody has that same investment in your story right and can help you think through things and then uh, building on something Laura saying because you said you're a pantser so I'm the person who like wants to add like a thousand subplots you know <laughs> and, <laughs> and and Madeline by training is a journalist and so I'll be like what if you know like what if there are you know you know an alligator breaks loose from the zoo you know and, and Madeline has a very good sense of like okay what's actually going to like help move the story along and what's yeah. going to be a distraction and so I, I'm, I'm grateful that she she keeps me and my my sometimes insane ideas in check. <laughs> That's for a different story. Yeah. <laughs> Alligators and hula hoops. There we go. Okay, so here's a question along that lines from our customers here. Did you guys have arguments while work while writing the books? Hmm. Oh my gosh. I I mean I don't think that there were arguments. There were certainly things that we didn't agree on. But, um, you know, we're adults and um, we, we had, you know, it's kind of like having, I mean, it was a thing we were doing together. So arguments would not really have solved anything. There were definitely a lot of instances where we didn't agree with how something should happen or we both were equally like, if, you know, invested in a certain thing um, that we, but we always talked about it. And we tried to make sure that, you know, okay, uh, the, the it, whatever was ultimately good for the story is what we decided on. And that's, that's hard, obviously, you know, when you're your own person, you like to get your own way, especially because your book is such a big part of you. And now you have to share this big part of you with somebody else and accept that it's not just your thing, it's two people's thing. So um, we never had arguments, but we did have a lot of times where we had to kind of negotiate and work through things. Yeah, I think negotiation is is really the key. And I'm just thinking, you know, like, and Madeline and uh, Wendy were saying, there's also the trust piece. I remember there was a scene that I had written um, where a character was really, really angry. And Sadia was like, mm, this is not working. And I had to say, I have to, I have to write it this way at least once, and then I'll come back and fix it. And know that Sadia trusted me that that was mm. something for whatever reason that I needed mm. to be able to do. Um, 
so being able to give each other some space, like you, you guys were saying, to, to test ideas out, even if, the, if, even if your co-author knows it's not going to work, they still trust you enough that it's part of your process. <laughs> so I guess respect for each other's mm -hmm. way of doing things is really an, an important part of what makes it work. Yeah, um, we didn't have any real arguments. I can be very nitpicky about things that Wendy is less nitpicky about. This also goes back to journalism. Like if our story is set in April or May of 1984, then if it happened, you know, in June of 1984, it can't go in there. And Wendy was like, can't we just fudge a little? And, and, and yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what Madeline's talking about, that, 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 that's actually the, the example I was thinking of. We were trying to, you know, give people the sense of what the 80s were like in terms of the Cold War and how we had all these movies about the USSR, you know, and what if the, you know, what if the Russians invaded? What if we did this? And I really wanted to mention this one movie and it was off our timeline by three months. And... Yeah. yeah, and I was, and I, and I don't know, like, like I'm trained as a lawyer, Madeline's trained as a journalist, and maybe that gives you a sense of the integrity of our relative professions. I don't know, <laughs> but I was, you know, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but no, yeah, but you know, it, the thing is, we were able to to find an, a way to work it around so that we both could still feel comfortable with the stories we presented it, and I feel like that's more important. It, you know, I wouldn't want to push for a point of view or even, you know, even just a, you know, a detail that would make Madeline feel uncomfortable. That's not, mm -hmm. that's not okay. And I think Laura summed it up really well. I think it was Laura who, uh, who, you know, said the good of the story. Yes. I mean, I think that's always I think what. Sadia said that. Sadia. Credit where credit's due. But I <laughs> think right. that's, that's true. You know, there, mm -hmm. and I think that even in our, on our solo projects, we, we sometimes feel that way. It's, you know, we write a scene that we really love and it's hard to let go of, but mm -hmm. it's not, if it's not moving the story, story forward at some point, um, you know, you say to yourself as an author, either my, my original idea or whatever I was going for here, I'm stuck on it because it was my idea, but now the story has reached a point where I can see that it's not in service of the story and you let go of those things. That's hard. It is hard. <laughs> um, I think for Laura and I, we never argued over uh, the story. I think our, our, well, not arguments, but our differences were on how to write probably would be, you know, we have very different styles of writing. Um, I like to write one draft and make it perfect. And Laura likes to like write many drafts and have them be wildly different from each other sometimes. And uh, that would be something that, you know, I would be like, just, just write it right now. And then she would say, well, I'll write it in the next draft. And that would, I would freak out because I'm like, there's no next draft. What are you talking about? <laughs> this is the draft. So it was, and I think that was for me a big learning experience because I learned, I actually do that more now with my, with my other work where I'm able to say, okay, I don't need to do it all right now. I can mm -hmm. go back and when I, um, I still think it takes more time. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was more the arguments over how to work rather than um, what to put in the book. Right. Here's another customer question. What is the best part for you guys of writing a book? Hmm. Of writing a book in general, oh my gosh. I mean, uh, you know, for me, it's always been there are like so many stories in my head. I got to get them out before they drive me nuts. I mean, that's literally for me, writing any book is just having this imagination that, you know, that, that, that needs to go down so that other people can join me in my mm -hmm. adventures. I'm a big revise. I'm, I love revision. And so I feel like my favorite part is there's a moment where you're revising, where you, you, you know, you have um, a draft down on paper. So you have an understanding of the world and the shape of the story. And you, you're literally like, I could put this in here and, um, and it's going to change the story in this way. And it's almost like, I don't know, not like the matrix, but I almost <laughs> see it in my head like tiles. I'm taking a tile and I'm moving it mm -hmm. and to create the big picture. And I love that moment when, when I can see the whole thing and I know, you know, what I have to do is move things around and 
that's it, it creates this whole story that then somebody else is going to come in and enter um, but that to me is my favorite part. I'm not a happy drafter, but I'm a very happy reviser as Sadia alluded to before. Um, Alan, what about you? Yeah, I, I like, um, I hadn't actually thought about that question before, but I think I like when I finish the first draft, like when the first draft is done and I know it could be a book. You know, it's not a good book yet, and there's more work to go, but I've gotten far enough, and there's an ending on it, and it it could be, and I think that's the part that makes me most excited. Wendy? I feel, I feel like we're talking about two different, because I thought oh, the yeah. question was about books, okay. and we're talking about writing. To me, like, oh, yeah. you know, okay. Oh. Hmm. to me, like, writing from day to day is like, you know, like I like, it's like exercise. I like having written. I don't like anticipating <laughs> any good, like that sometimes I'm just like, oh gosh, you know, here we go. You know, like, am I, am I, can I do this today? But I think one of the things I really loved about the book part is just all the people you meet who, who love, you know, they're the people who love books in this world, see the world differently than people who don't. And, you know, like when you meet book people, you know, you, you're going to have these deep convers you know the book is part of a deep conversation but then to also meet the people and to have these you know to say like oh you know like I really you know I love the way you did this or you know like I just love having the opportunity and you know we will get past this 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 moment in time where we can see each other in person and just start having those wonderful conversations again. So oh, that's wonderful. Well here's another question for everyone. Um, so I know Wendy went into this a little bit. Tell us about your experiences in life and in writing Facing Prejudice or Racism. Wow, <laughs> that, that's a very big question. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, I didn't grow up in this country. So for me, my experiences are very different from my readership. Uh, so a lot of times I end up looking at my kids and what they are going through and have been going through and will go through as first generation muslim american brown kids um there's like so much so much baggage that they have to carry just because i and my husband made a decision to move across the ocean and settle in another in another part of the world and i i try to think about that a lot and I actually started writing because of that. Um, my Yasmin series, which is an early reader series, I, I started, I, I wrote the first one when my daughter was in kindergarten mm. and she was just starting to read by herself and then she just wouldn't read. She would look at books from you know the library or bookstore and then she would put them down. And I was very frustrated and I kept asking her why. And this little kid finally, of course, it's hard to articulate anything at that age. He's like, none of these people in these books look like me. Why should I read about them? And it was like this light bulb moment, you know, for me as not only a mom, but as a writer that she's right. A lot of kids, you know, maybe can't identify or they don't want to. They just don't feel attracted to something that's so different from their own worldview. And that's how I got into children's writing. So it's, it's in every part of my work um, as my kids have grown older the the books i'm writing are also changing and becoming as my daughter says more dark because you know um and especially a place at the table i wrote when my son was in middle school and he was being very bullied for his name and 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 you know just awful things happening not just from students but from teachers as well i actually had to change his name he developed this neurological disorder that I had to, like, you know, it was just a nightmare for my family. And I, that's how I dealt with it, with, by writing about some of those experiences. And I continue to do that because I think that um, even if it's not something, if, if, I, my kids aren't the only ones going through all of this. And if I can present something to the world that can help them feel less alone and maybe learn how to deal with it or maybe help their peers realize that, you know, how they treat their fellow classmates or even as adults, how we treat other people is not really the best way, then I feel like I did my part, so. 
Yeah, I'm just going to be very brief so I can pass it along to Madeline and Wendy. Um, you know, yes, that I experienced some things because of being Jewish. Sometimes I experienced some um, pushback from peers because they didn't know I was Jewish because I don't look Jewish, whatever that means. I'm not sure what that means. Um, but more for me, I think, is, and one of the reasons why I wanted to write this story and ask Sadia to write it with me, is that first generation American experience of feeling like you don't belong, like, um, you know, you have this feeling of being very connected to your family's home culture, but when you go to visit grandparents across the ocean, you know, people are calling you Yank or, you know, saying like, you have brown, like, what's up with the brown eyes? Everybody in, else in the family has blue eyes or whatever. Um, and yet here in the States, there are things that set you apart because of the ways that your family does things that are different than a typical American family. And it's very interesting. I can't remember who it was in particular that we talked with Saudi. It may have been um, Susan Mawadi Diraj. And we were talking about how my kids, like the kids who are, you know, not the first generation, but a, a generation then removed with grandparents who came here from another country, they don't experience that disconnect. It's like it's it's gone, but they also don't have that deep connection to the um to the original culture. And so there's a loss there too, um, as the generations go by. Madeline? Um, yeah, just thinking about what you said. So now I'll think about what I'm gonna say. Um, I think for me, um, you know, I definitely had experiences when I was a kid. With me, it's sort of like my last name. As soon as somebody hears the name Rosenberg, they're like, oh, she must be Jewish. And, you know, I would get stuff from kids, um, you know, somebody used to throw rocks at me at the bus stop um, because I was Jewish. And, but the other thing is that I used to get, you know, I'll run into things as an adult too. And every time it catches me off guard and every time I don't know what to say <laughs> from for myself to, you know, I have all these comebacks, Wendy and I were talking about this, that, you know, we think about later, but I could never get them out during. And, you know, I see my kids, a lot of people don't know that they're Jewish because they have a different last name than me. Um, and so when things creep up into conversation, it's either because somebody knows or because that's just the way they are. And, and that's just kind of, you know, hurts my heart too, <laughs> to, to hear about. Um, but my daughter was telling me about like the first time it happened to her in class and this kid that she absolutely could not stand stepped in and was like, hey, you can't say stuff like that. And so she can stand him a little bit more right now <laughs> because he spoke up. Yeah, I think um, yeah we were yeah we were having this conversation last night, and I think it kind of ties into something Sadi was saying was, you know, I think part of the reason why we write is that opportunity to say I finally had that comeback, and I'm gonna put it in a story, but I have to share something because I feel like there there is always this pressure, right? But like, like you know you you were supposed to say something, you know you're supposed to assert your own humanity, and to let us ourselves off the hook, and to say no, you know that's not our job when someone is being out of bounds. That's not, it's not our job to have the snappiest comeback or, you know what I mean? Like you, you can, I mean, if you can, that's great. But I mean, not to like punish yourself mentally for, for being unable to do that because, because we're not in the wrong, we're not in the wrong for that. So, yep. Um, so my own experience, I mean, it's, it's so odd because I was thinking about it when I first, so I live in Fairfax County, Virginia. It's a very wealthy, populous state. But when we first moved here in the seventies, there were very, very few Asians. And I feel like, I went back and I found like these, these reports on the demographics. And I mean, they were literally hand counting Asian people. <laughs> and they, they're like, there are 538 Chinese people and 272 Thai people. And, um, and so I feel like I was probably the first Asian kid that a lot of the kids met. And there were, you know, a lot of hurtful things that were said, but now Fairfax County is incredibly diverse. I think it's 20% 20 20 Asian. And my, and my kids, you know, have a whole wealth of diversity of friends. But I also just, I also feel like these times being what they are, 
you know, it's not, for me, it's not the person to person interaction that's happening. It's what I'm seeing on the news. It's things I'm seeing on social media that really break my heart sometimes, you know, and you know, it's kind of working on those two different levels. That's really hard. I also want to just um, state, you know, Wendy, for the record, that a lot of times adults in our lives, they, we tend to think that, okay, if we live in a diverse environment, um, then we're not going to have these problems because we are all used to being with each other. Uh, I, ha I, I personally have not found that to be true. I mean, I live in Texas, which is super diverse, especially mm -hmm. the big cities like Houston. Um, in fact, there are very, very few um, white kids in any school that, that I know of. And uh, there's still, you know, a lot of racism and there's a, still mm -hmm. a lot of things that go on. Um, and that's, that's like you said, that the national discourse is so important. What we hear in the news from our leaders is so important. But I think that if any parents and teachers and librarians are listening, they should also understand that, you know, that should never be, yes. if you live in a diverse community, that does not mean that you're, you're, free you're somehow off those yeah. things. Yeah, um, that's a very good just, point. It, it's, you know, because it's human nature to judge and to be biased and to be ignorant. And unless each one of us take a step mm -hmm. to improve our knowledge and to get to know other people, we're, we're still, we're still going to be in that same situation. Absolutely. I have another question for you from a customer. How do you come up with the protagonist while writing books? Specifically, a place at the table and not your American girl. So how do you come up with those protagonists? Laura, you want to go? Should we just go sure, yeah. okay. no, You go, go ahead and then I'll, I'll go after you. Uh, for me, my protagonists are always um, probably one of my kids. I don't know what I do when I'm run out of stories that my kids tell me. Um, uh, most of my work is based on what they're going through and so for a place at the table like I said at that time my son was going through a lot of stuff being teased for his name being teased for who he was and I wanted to um, write a character that was going through some of that stuff who was prickly and not really you know into making friends just because of the things that they had seen so I blame my kids for everything I do <laughs> Um, for me, for this book in particular, this is the first time I've written a character who's based, uh, loosely based, but based on myself growing up. So Elizabeth um, has a lot of things in common with me when I was growing up. I tend to start with um, not a character, but a situation and in a story. And, um, you know, the character develops from there. And often whatever I thought about the character when I started is very different by the time I reach the end of the first draft. So usually by the end of the first draft is when I have a real sense of who the character is. The only time that I had that experience, you hear people talk about where a character comes on the scene and introduces themselves and you can just hear their voice is um, with takedown. I had this character, the girl on an all boys wrestling team, as soon as I started writing her, she was a minor character. Her voice was very clear to me. So that's happened to me once. And I invite the muses to let it happen again. Bring it to me. <laughs> Madeline, what about you? Uh, well, Wendy and I should probably explain this part together because yeah. that actually kind of um, shows a little bit. We approached our books very mm -hmm. differently because sure. um, Laura and Sadia were writing about two different characters mm -hmm. so they each got a protagonist <laughs> yes. and Wendy and I blended ourselves um into one yes. and so I guess um for this book the protagonist actually spun out of the last one so Wendy what do you remember about how we um brought David into the world <laughs> <laughs> boy I think yeah, I think we had to take a couple of runs. You know, I think, I mean, as I recollect, it's probably a process closer to what Laura is describing where we had 
kind of an external shell and then you have to kind of figure out who's the most interesting person to go through that journey. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that, that turned into David and there were just, you know, and then we also had the, the fun of just, you know, going into the eighties and thinking of how kids lived back then and what would be kind of an interesting way to show, you know, how people played Trivial Pursuit without phones and things like that. So I think there was, there was an element to that. I remember that you were really pushing for like, to make sure that they were active, that, that David was an, an, an active participant in his story and that he had something to actually physically do. Right. But, so then when we spun to Lauren, mm -hmm. we yeah. were doing what you mentioned earlier, just sort of like finding the breadcrumbs back. Mm -hmm. And we were actually pleased by how many there were and yeah. who he was as a person. And then as we were writing, her voice just kind of came out yes. more and more. Yeah. And I think like one of the most important questions as a children's author I've learned, and this was from Mary Quattlebaum, who uh, a lot of us know because she's a DC area writer, is um, the question, how does my character grow or change throughout the story? And so you have to kind of give your character a room to grow and to, to think or to learn something new. Wonderful. Well, could you all tell us a little bit about writing humor? I think it seems so very difficult. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Writing humor? I have no clue. Someone should teach me how to write. I'm, I'm like the least funny person and um, I can make jokes when, you know, it, it, they're not expected, but if I have to write a funny character, I just, I don't know. I, I'm not the right person to ask this. Laura, do you know how to, how to write funny things? I'm actually working on my first like humor piece right now, but I love tucking in little funny moments. So I think in a place at the table, um, for me, there's an election day scene and Elizabeth like dresses in this totally over the top red, white and blue outfit um, that I, I find hilarious. And um, just, you know, we have a, a teacher in the book, much like Madeline and, and Wendy have the, the drama coach who's, um, well, now we call them microaggressions, but they wouldn't have been called that in the 80s. Um, but we have Mrs. Klukowski, the, the home economics or um, facts, as it's called in Howard County, teacher. And just like once we once I thought of the name Klukowski and that the kids call her Mrs. Kluck, like her whole character sort of fell into place. I think Sadia was the one who suggested that she wear brown a lot. And then we just like added the plaid and... Um, gave her a very sort of like barrel chested physique and sensible shoes and you know those little details then you've, you've got a cat like you've got a personality and I have a lot of fun um, with those type of characters and and being a little bit over the top even when a story is realistic. Um, well the first thing I want to say about humor is that I feel like people sometimes underestimate its importance. And I feel like its importance is huge, especially when you're dealing with tough issues. And, um, you know, it, it helps people maybe relax enough to understand the tough issues a little bit more. And, you know, with, with writing, I think, yes, yeah, some of it is situational. Like, you know, there's the things that you say that are funny, but there's also putting somebody in a situation that has potential for the humor. And I think that um, can make a really big difference. And yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, what I, I mean, when I saw like, the first thing I thought of was our grandmothers and uh, they tie in so perfectly to, I, I love talking about how to write, you know, how to write certain things. Oh, and then what's, what's that great quote? Like tragedy is easy, humor is hard, or I forget exactly what it is, but it's so true. And um, the best thing I've ever read about writing humor is humor, a humor situation comes from two people wanting divergent things. You know, and they want two very different things. And, and for Lauren's grandmothers, it's always like, and they're, they're so nitpicky, like they kind of want the same thing, but they want it their way. And so that's where you kind of get like these fantastic, like, what do you, what do you passive aggressive comments between the two of them? So I think uh, for me, like, that's all I, if I'm trying to approach a funny scene, I always think about like, 
what do they want that's different and how far will they go to get that different thing? Right. And Wendy and I do also like like to make each other laugh like that. Oh yeah. Oh oh yeah. Should we talk about the style invitational? Sure. Do we do so <laughs> to one of the keys to getting through this pandemic is the Washington Post has a weekly humor contest called the Style Invitational. And they're like really crazy like things. Like they'll say like uh Take, um, take the names of the horses in the Kentucky Derby, pick two of them. And if, if, you know, based on their names, if they bred together, what would the name of their fold be? And then you can, people come up with all these, you know, different crazy names or write a haiku about, you know, uh, something that starts with the letter H. And so I got into it and then I was like saying to them, I'm like, like, you need to try this out. And it's just been kind of a great little exercise to have a very discreet charge to what to do and kind of as a creative exercise, figure out like, okay, like how would I, how would I do this? Right. And the, and the goal is just making somebody smile. Yes. Yeah. We them. like, we like to tell each other what our entries are and crack each other up. Okay. Here's an audience question. Who came up with the character Micah? I'm not sure if I said that right, but. That, that yes. <laughs> I'm raising my hand. Um, he is a friend of Elizabeth's in a place at the table. And um, yeah, I don't even know what to tell you about Micah. He's loosely, loosely based on a, a friend of my son's when my son was growing up. Um, but that's more like appearance and vibe. His, his uh, drumming, he's a percussionist. My son was a percussionist in middle school. So I just, like we were saying before, you sort of pull these little details from things in your kids' lives, in your own life. And, and next thing you know, you have a character who's completely different from um, the person you originally based them on. And to me, that's good because I want them to stand alone as a believable fictional character. You know, for us at the place of the table, we were each in charge of our own like world. So it was easy to do because we had two characters, two worlds and two families. So everybody who's in Elizabeth's circle is my creation and everything who is in um, Elizabeth, uh, in Sarah's is mine and then Elizabeth is Laura's. But then there were a couple of teachers that we kind of, you know, um, came up came up with and the school environment is more is more um, together. But Micah's cool. I like him. Okay, I have one. I have another question here, please, um, if you would um, explain what it means to be bicultural. And then um, if you have anything else to add, please go ahead and add um, anything else you'd like to share with the audience. Um, about writing together or writing in general, please. Thank you. Bicultural is an interesting word. I actually had never used it before I met Laura and Laura uses it a lot. So I'm like, oh, that's a good word to define, you know, not me, but what my kids are, I guess. Um, for people like me who are like the newcomers to, to another place, for us, I think that the, the, the goal is to keep your culture intact because that's the thing that's under you know that's that's under threat that is going to go away because your kids are growing up here so so we've always tried in my family to be very pakistani and muslim and, and asian in general and uh, obviously the kids who were born here and growing up here are kind of like completely rebelling against that um, all the time so it's kind of a give and take uh, for my for in my family my cultural has meant just kind of uh, straddling both sides of, or, or two continents, having one one foot on one and one foot on the other. Um, we, my husband and I, we do it probably with much more ease than my kids. And um, it's a lot of, it's a lot of learning how things are done. It's a lot of uh, figuring out how your culture can still survive in a place where other things are expected. A lot of it is cool and fun. You know, you can like food is a very big part of it where you can kind of um, adopt new things in your food and, and kind of make fusion like we do in a place at the table. But then other things are a little bit more challenging, like especially your religious beliefs or, or how you practice things, your dress, um, the hijab, for example, which um, Sarah's mom wears is a prime example of how it's not just 
faith versus culture there together because dress makes up culture and dress also in this case for Muslims makes up religion. So, you know, I remember my daughter one time in second grade uh, coming, uh, you know, we would, I would wait for her in the car, in the carpool lane, and then she came in and she sat down, she was so mad at me. And she said, can you not get out of the car anymore when you come look for me? Because everyone asked me what you're wearing and I don't know what to say. And I just, I just felt so sad. I was like, but you know, this is, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. So that led to a lot of conversations, but then unfortunately in my family, that's always meant sadly a negative thing. And I'm trying really hard to not make it a negative thing being bicultural. Yeah, I use bicultural um, as the term, you know, of, of any identity that's out there. That's what I, that's what I call myself. That's what I associate with because to say I'm British American only tells a piece of me. To say I'm Jewish American only tells a piece. To say I'm first generation American only tells a piece. But if I say I'm bicultural, it gives a sort of an understanding for how I grew up, which is, as Sadi was saying, sort of like having one foot in two very different worlds and um, feeling both equally part of those worlds, but equally also excluded from those worlds. So to me, it's become a really important identifier. Um, and that's, you know, that's why I use it. My kids would not identify as bicultural. Um, they are just like, American kids with seven, I think we counted seven different um, sort of heritage areas or ethnicities. Um, so they're very, very much American in a way that I was not or didn't feel that I was when I was growing up. Yeah, and I, I don't tend to think of myself as bicultural. I just think of myself as an American who happens to be in a minority religion and you know, sometimes it might come up like when my kids, you know, have to miss school and nobody else does for a holiday or something like that. But our character um, is definitely um, bicultural. And there's something that we say in um, the first book, and this is just a test, which is not half of each, but all of both um, that I tend to think of too. Wendy, what about you? Yeah, I don't, I don't use that term either. Um, and I'm trying to, like, I'm trying to think of why I don't, I mean, there were, there was certainly a lot of pressure to assimilate into, you know, kind of mainstream American culture and, and you know, for, for good or bad or, you know, whatever it, that's, that's it. But it's really interesting. Like I joined this group on Facebook, uh, much to the fury of my oldest child who's over here, um, called uh, subtle, Amer subtle Asian traits. And they're like the little things that like, I think they're mostly second generation kids like myself kind of recognize as kind of these just like little day to day things that are a little bit different from, you know, what other people might be experiencing. And I've, I've found it oddly comforting to like read these things and discover that these, these, these things that you think might be happening just to you are actually quite universal. And so I think that's another way of looking at it. <laughs> I don't have any other questions from the audience, so we can either wrap up or if you have any last uh, thoughts to share briefly. I would like to say just in closing that at the place of the table, Laura and I um, wanted to be sure that we not only depicted what life was like for a lot of um, immigrant families, but we also wanted to give um, a way to move forward. So it's not just this is how the problem is or these are the struggles that they face, but really how to work around them. So every issue that we've identified, and we do it in a way that kids find it's not boring or it's not, you know, it's still, it's still a fun book, I think, but it's got tools that um, you can use to learn how to be an ally, to learn how to stand up to people, what is the right way versus the wrong way um, to deal with, with, with a situation in which you are a witness that something is happening that shouldn't be happening, uh, as well as with mental illness, um, how to work with people and what the, what, what the solution is. 
um, with these kind of situations, obviously, you know, we're not psychologists, not, we're not talking about mental illness in general. So I think that that was very important to us with the place at the table that we don't just portray life as it is, but also how life can be and um, present some, some answers to, to the questions that kiddos might have when they read the book. I did. I, Madeline and I had a chance to talk um, earlier in the week, and one of the things we were talking about that comes up in both books is this situation where a kid um, who's a person of color um, experiences some kind of, like we said, a microaggression or, or outward racism, and they have a friend, and they're disappointed in how their friend responds. That's something that's in both of our books, and I think that it's important to, you know, not only that we've shown that, but in both stories, the, the friends are, are able to talk things through. And mm -hmm. um, the kid who was the target of the microaggression is able to say, you didn't respond the way I needed you to. And then the friend is able to, you know, they're able to work together and say, like, how do I do this differently so that you feel supported in our friendship? And Sadi and I were very intentional in showing that these girls are in middle school and they're mature enough to have these conversations with each other and that they both value their friendship um, which I think uh, Tara and Lauren do too. They value their friendship enough that it's not like, oh, you made me feel uncomfortable and now we're done, mm -hmm. which so yeah. often happens in middle school, <laughs> um, but that they can talk things through. Yeah, and that the whole being an ally thing, especially when you're not able to talk for yourself in that moment mm -hmm. is so important. Um, that was something it, there were a couple of things that our books had in common that were, you know, so that is one of the more serious ones. And then they both mentioned the A-team and they both <laughs> mentioned designer jeans. <laughs> that was hilarious. I think another thing that we... That's uh, funny. Yeah. <laughs> So some things just you know they kind of make an imprint on you and they just never leave you. <laughs> I guess that's well. The I mean, you know, I'm, aren't we all living in the eighties? Yeah, <laughs> in our lives. <laughs> but I, I, the other thing I, I, I feel like we were intentional about in our book was that once Tara figures out what she's done, that she not become the focus of the solution. That she has to like empower you know like she kind of literally has to step aside and let you know and and make room for lauren and i think that's an important message to take away too like i also i also love what laura said that you know these are friends who have difficult conversation difficult and uncomfortable conversations and i hope that kids see that and say like oh you know i can I, we can have that we can do that it may not be perfect but you know we're gonna we can we can confront these issues and then the other issue is just you're not making it a, a thing where it has to be solved, you know, that the, that the, the, the character of color can also be the agent of solving the problem and not rely on the other, the, the white character for, for solving the problem. Be the hero of your own story. Be, thank you. Thank you. Be the Cheesy, hero of but it's true. Story. It's so true. I was also interested though in um, the character of Tara, I think, we, you reminded me because we were talking about this a little bit before, but she is so unaware of her own privilege, mm -hmm. which would have been very true of the 80s. But, um, you know, part of the storyline with Tara is her waking up and seeing that she she is treated differently because of how she looks. And she seems to have been unaware of that and how it might feel to Lauren. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you oh, for thank you so much. giving us your time. Uh, I just want to remind everyone in the chat, I put in the link for if you're interested in purchasing a book from one of the authors with a signed book plate, you may do that through Books of the Past, or you may go to the library's website to place a request for per curbside pickup or Yay. online. <laughs> We love library. Thank you all. So much, <laughs> no, thank you, yes. Carrie. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank yeah, you author everyone. teams. I feel like we all need to do a, a Wonder Twins. Like, <laughs> a team. I don't know. <laughs> a team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank, 
Thanks, Bye. everybody. Take Thank care, you. everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Happy writing. Bye. Bye. Okay, Deborah, everybody's gone.